Okay, good evening. Are you all fresh enough to talk about money? <laughs> so, um, it is actually a great pleasure for me to be here with Fred Davis and with Cordell. Um, the topic of today is really about mergers and investments on structured capital coming into the music business. Um, nothing new. Some of the bigger labels have been doing it for years, but it's one of the first times over the last few years that I call it structured capital, uh, which would mean private equity players, which would mean other players working through the likes of the Rain Group, uh, working through Cordell's company, which also which is called Welcome to the Block, um, investing in you know a bun bunch of other stuff, and it is actually a large endorsement that this panel is happening here because. The Rain Group opens its offices in Singapore tomorrow. Um, you know, and Cordell already has a presence in Singapore, so it's, it's actually the right and opportune moment to be able to do that. Um, what we are going to do on this panel is actually demystify what it means to be investing in the music business. Um, what does it mean? Second part of this is what do you actually do with the money? Third part of it is what do the investors bring to the table besides the money? Um, and the fourth is, what are the investors looking to get out of it? Um, so we're going to start with Fred. Um, why is structured capital or private equity investing in platforms, businesses, music, and catalog? Well, it's um, good to be here, everybody. And, and uh, it's fun to try to make talking about money interesting and fun. But we'll, we'll do that because money is really the engine the fuel for ideas. And it's the starting point for our relationships with companies. But typically when we, in, we find a company, our investing strategy is to get them at a growth level. One of the companies you may know of that we've invested in is SoundCloud. We invested in about five years ago. But beyond just the capital, we typically like to be on the boards of the companies. We like to get our hands dirty and helping on the strategies on how a company like SoundCloud could evolve, stay fresh. It was launched, I think, 13 years ago at this point. Yeah. And we help with the guiding the CEOs, helping with hirings and helping with strategies. And what we want to get out of it is uh, you know, ultimately, we do want to make money, okay? I mean, it's, it's as blatant as that, but we can make a difference along the way. We have fun along the way. Uh, we're not trying to change anything. Well, we, we have another company we invested in called Firebird, which people will hear about. We're acquiring management companies in independent labels, and we're trying to build a new form music company where we can make a difference. So sometimes it's about making a difference most of the time, Sorry to say, it's about making money. Sure, and we'll come to a lot of that a little later in the panel uh, in terms of what you really actually get to the table. But Cordell, um, welcome to the block. Um, if you could just help the audience here sort of demystify uh, what is it that you guys do at Welcome to the Block and how do you view the world either similarly to the Rain Group or what you're doing differently because we spoke backstage about the fact that you're investing in DeFi, you know, uh, into companies like Sound.xyz, um, the metaverse and stuff like that, so, and, and of course the creators as well. Yeah, you know, um, it's very similar to what Fred said, you know, we obviously want to make money, um, but we also want to help the CEOs, we want to help these companies, um, and sometimes it's just strategically, you know, placing influential acts that could, you know, bring their communities to those platforms, to those brands. Um, for example, you know, I invested into Yuga Labs and, you know, I brought Eminem, a huge influential figure, um, and he owns an ape. My father, Snoop Dogg, owns an ape. And, you know, we had an idea of letting the ape embody who they were as artists. And for the VMAs last month, we got to perform at the VMAs as the apes. So it was the first performance in the metaverse um, at the VMAs. And, you know, it just helps with mainstream mass adoption. 
Um, Because ultimately, the more people in this space, the more money we can all make, and the more, I think, you know, the platform is more meaningful. Obviously, we are in an infancy stage, so it's going to take time for technology to meet, you know, our standards and and what we're comfortable with. And welcome to the block. We just want to invest in the next creators, the next innovators, and the next builders. Right. Um, I'm going to ask the next one which is a very simple thing of once you raise capital, what is it that you do with the money? And this sort of question is in two parts. One is, what does the entrepreneur or the founder of the company do with the money? I heard that both of you were talking about growth stage, bringing in value. What is it that you expect out of the entrepreneur or the founder? And separate to that, if you could answer, um, what is it that As an acquirer, what is your interest in the company? I mean, one part is getting along for the ride. But the second part is, is there an exit? Is there an M&A? Is there that you're just looking to be stay invested for a long time? So, Fred, yeah. Um, Maybe a couple of examples. Yeah, okay. So, a couple things there. When when we invest, there's there's sometimes a distinction between investing primary capital that goes into the company versus secondary capital that the people can take off the table and put in their pocket. Understood. We, we tried to make most of the investment going into the company. And it varies a little bit differently. We have a, a later stage investing company and an earlier stage investing company. The earlier stage, you, you're going to hang on to that for, let's say, seven to 10 years. And so at the later stage, it's three to five years, maybe four to six years. And is that uh, the general standard? It's industry standard, it's more our standard, and it's not mathematical, it's about expectation. When you're investing early like you're doing, you can take a lot of chances. Web 3.0 is gonna take a long time to really mature. Um, People invested in Spotify in 2004 and 2005. It took a long time for that. We have a company we invest in in Stockholm called Amuse, which is an earlier stage investment for us. And that's about becoming a new type of music label using the data developed from music distribution and how you use that data to sign artists. Now they're four years into the journey. It'll be another four or five years before they hopefully have risen to great levels. But we're helping build it. But we do it early early that way. Right. And, And do you work with the founder or the entrepreneur on a fairly frequent basis? Yeah, we're on the board. We... There's a woman named Roshi that we uh, we have uh, quarterly board meetings, monthly board calls. I'm in Stockholm. I live in London. I'm there every few months. And so we're very actively involved with it. Absolutely. Right. right. And Cordell, um, just in terms of the same question, right? What is it that you expect out of the founder or the entrepreneur to, do be, to be working with your capital that you put in into the business? Well, really, you know, the, the founders and the, the CEOs should be already, you know, innovating themselves. And when I invest, I want to bring more to the table than there was before I, before I entered the, the space. And for example, you know, a company like Sound XYZ, um, you know, it's similar to SoundCloud, but the Web3 version. Um, and it gives creators a chance to really interact with their communities. And what I saw was it was the low-hanging fruit for artists to want to enter into music NFTs. Um, so, for example, you know, I brought Bobby Schmurter. Um, he was recently released from prison. Um, he, he didn't have any music out at the time. So David Greenstein and, and Bobby, they sat down and came up with a game plan for Bobby to release a song, and it sold out in, in seconds. Um, and from there, you know, Bobby was electrified and he told all his peers and, you know, that led to more artists being aware of this platform. What, is, what does it do differently than SoundCloud? What, what does it allow? Well, it's on the blockchain. So that's um, one. And then second, you have Creative Commons. So when artists drop songs, the whoever buys that song, you get to remix it, you get to do whatever you want with it. And I think that's unique because for years, artists like, you know, my dad, for example, he charges a quarter of a million dollars for a verse. 
you get to buy that NFT for a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. And if you're an aspiring artist, you know that that right there is just a, a huge, I think, um, impact on your career instantly. And then it just gives you a different platform. You get to be heard in a different way versus just being another comment on a platform or just being another consumer. You get to actually be a part of that artist's journey and that artist gets to be a part of your journey as well. See, now I want yeah. to invest in that company, right? That's exactly Absolutely. Come on, There's Fred, we got room idea. for you. <laughs> Kazi, you I'm, I'm going to ask for a piece of that. <laughs> do you use this company? Yeah, okay. That's yeah. what I want to do. Okay. There you yeah. go. Actually, just so that you, you all know, and I'm sure you all know, uh, Codell's dad is Snoop Dogg, and, and Fred comes from a illustrious family, and, uh, and Clive Davis, uh, one of the greatest in our men in the world, is his father. And by the way, if anyone's interested, my father's an architect, too. <laughs> I want to ask Fred a question. I know you're doing the Go narrative. for it. Go I, for it. I just want to ask a question. So, you know, obviously both of our fathers are, are legends and, you know, respected in their field of business. How did you manage to get out of your father's shadow? Because I'm, you know, I'm early in my business um, and, and, you know, striving to get to a point where you are. Um, so I just wanted to ask that question while I'm up here with you. You're never out of the shadow. I mean, I'm, you know, that that's... Uh, part of the answer. But the other answer is, is um, I never worked for him. I just hustled on my own. You know, thought I was going to be a doctor and then realized I was going to be very bad at that and better for the world. And, you, you know, we grew up in music. I mean, you know, it's not like they were in shipping, right? And so it became it's very attractive. But it was the idea of forming your own path. And that was just, I uh, was lucky that I was able to do it. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, what is it that each of you looks to get out of the companies that you've invested in? And, you know, ask that, and we spoke about this. Is it what kind of an exit are you looking or not an exit? It's very, you know, it's, well, we, for those who don't fully understand, and I, I'm trying at the most basic level, we invest other people's money. We're not investing our own money. So yeah. we raise money to invest. It's a complicated process. We have obligations to them. They expect to get a return on the money they give us. So the most important answer is we want to get a return on the investment to our what are called limited partners, to the people who've trusted us with their money. Simple as that. Right. And that exit could be either another acquisition or an M&A or a listing? The, depending on the there's company. typically two types of exits where you can get the return on your capital. One is the company gets acquired by a third party, and the other option is it goes public. Those are really That's the only two options. There can be more complicated ones, but those are the two basic, and those are the two types of, of expectations we have when we make investments. Right, right. Um, there's a bit of noise on stage here, so can I request people in the audience to not talk loudly, please? Thank you. Uh, Cordell. What is it that you look for as an exit out of any of the companies or people that you work with? Let's say a, maybe a sound.xyz. Is there an exit period that you look at or are you looking to stay invested? Well, you know, I'm so early in all of this. You know, I've just been getting my feet wet and trial and error, you know, to be completely honest. Um, and I'm, I'm, I got my post to, on the culture and I see this shift happening. You know, I see the similarities of when the internet first started and I see the similarities of Web3 right now. And I just don't want my culture to be last. You know, we always late to the party. We always come when the ac accusations are made and, and, you know, things are valued at billions of dollars. I want us to be in those rooms. And when I say us, I'm speaking on the entertainers, the athletes, you know, the youthful um, investors and, and CEOs. So really it's just about taking the, the intel and knowledge that I know and putting it in a form where it's digestible for them so that they can enter this space and be a part of it if they choose to. Most of the time we don't even know and it's not on our radar, you know, so we, we don't have a chance to invest. We don't have a chance to be a part of um, the next the next wave. So Is that why you're here in Singapore? Why are you here? A hundred percent. You know, I'm 25 years old, so I think it's big for, you know, the youth to see representation of what an investor looks like, 
what somebody looks like that's, you know, trying to pave his own name into a, a new field. And I think Singapore is the future. I think Asia is definitely a, a populated place where there's a lot of creators. There's a lot of uh, liquidity out here. And a lot of young people are looking for what's next. I feel like my generation, we tired of being a talent. Like, we understand our value. We understand that these companies need us. You know, influencers are getting smarter. So you're starting to see less, you know, uh, brand deals on, on, on social media so platforms. If I'm 25 years old and I'm in the audience and I have a new business that I want you to see to invest in it. Now, if you want, how do they find you? How do they, how do you, how do you see your opportunities? How do they get to you to show them their opportunities? I'm it's actually on. coming to that in a second. It's a little later in the battle. So no, no, no. Uh, rather okay. than we're rather ahead okay. of the battle. Okay. But uh, <laughs> since he's asked the question, maybe you can answer how do people reach out? I'm, I'm really hands on. Like when I was at um, NFT NYC, I made sure that I wasn't in the VIP areas. I was where everyone was at because I want to meet the young creators. I want to meet, you know, my peers. I call you guys my peers because we we on the same journey. You know, I'm just up here. I'm I'm on a, a bigger platform, and you know, if the idea sticks and if you know the. Hold on, I'm, I'm a. Peer. I'm <laughs> like no, you definitely appear. You definitely appear. We all young. We young in spirit, baby. You know, so like, I think it's just about like being optimistic. I'm extremely optimistic. I'm on Twitter. I'm on these platforms where you know I'm not hiding behind a wall like I'm 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 up close and, and personal so you know you can you can see me walking around uh Orchard Road you can see me out here in Singapore like trying to shake hands trying to meet people um and if you can't see me in person you can definitely reach me on Twitter and uh both of you have offices in Singapore and you've got an office in India um which you learned and uh, you know when we talk about Asia it's not really one place, there's Asia, South Asia, North Asia, there's India, South Asia. You're talking about different diasporas um, and like uh, that a hit can come out of anywhere. Today, creators of platforms, and we should talk a little bit about um, businesses that you guys have invested in that are actually playing in the NFT, Web3, Metaverse. Could you give us a couple of examples each? By the way, we also have offices in Shanghai and Hong Kong. So we were in a big Perfect. commitment to the broader region just as this advertisement. Um, one of the companies that we tried to invest in that we failed is more interesting, which was a company called Musical.ly, where it was a Shanghai-based company. Be we were beat late because we didn't meet them when they were early. We ended up working with them because we also have an advisory business where we help companies sell. But um, that was, uh, they would have loved to have invested in them. Another company that I would We'll, we, we are investing and will invest in one day is a company called Audius, which yep. is probably the leading Web 3.0 music platform. Um, you know, we, we would, I know on the earlier panel you were talking about move from vinyl to tape to CD to downloads to streaming. The next probable platform shift in music will probably be decentralized distribution where Spotify is centralized. That's decentralized, and I know that's what you're investing in, right? That That's 100%, exactly the area. 100%. Just because, you know, my whole Rolodex is majorly musicians and, and, and people in the music space, and you're starting to see them wanting to get closer to their fans and kind of, you know, break away from the traditional labels and, and what the business have looked like for the last 50 years. So I think something like this um, next wave that we're going to see is more artists being able to get closer to their communities and actually, you know, help them make money versus the consumers always just giving and giving and giving and giving. You know, this is a time where, like I said, the, the, not even just the talent, but consumers are getting smarter with how they're spending their money. And... We got to make it more, I think, enticing for consumers to want to keep investing in your career. You got to make it a, a two-way street. Right. That's what I think Web 3.0 is. And and uh, we spoke briefly backstage about, you know, at, at Death Row Records and your role as chief innovation officer. 
Um, do you want to elaborate a bit of that? It's what you're doing. Um, yeah. You got a pilister's past, and what are you going to do for the future? So for years, um, I told my dad, I'm like, because he would always complain how he didn't own the masters to doggy style. And I'm like, yo, Taylor Swift didn't own her catalog. So what she did was she re-recorded the, 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 the trackings to, to those songs and re-released them and told her fans, don't listen to that one, listen to this one. And her fans did exactly what she said. So I think over a period of time, it finally registered with him and he acquired Death Row. And what we did was, the first thing we did was we released 250 songs, not on Audius, but on Open Seat. Because my dad is impatient sometimes. So I'm like, you know, it's gonna take time to drop it on this platform. It's gonna take time. He like, I wanna do it now. Like we used to always tell him tomorrow. And tomorrow to him is a bad word. He like, I don't wanna hear tomorrow. I want, I want the shit now. Like, how can we get it done now? So I called Spotty. Spotty is an artist who, who successfully dropped um, NFTs on OpenSea. He made over 800 grand in like 60 seconds. Um, and we called him and Spotty was like, I strongly suggest that you guys do it on your own platform. Do not drop it. And I'm, I'm in the back like, oh my God, don't tell him that. So my dad like, okay, just because you said that, we're gonna drop it today. So we produced um, the record right then and there, I think it was called High. The, the first song we did was called High, ironically. Um, <laughs> so we we dropped the record. He he produced it too. He produces it. Um, and back to the Yuga Labs investment, I advised him to use his Bored Ape as the cover art instead of using a random picture and, and things of all kind of sorts that don't really make sense for music. I'm like, yo, you own the IP and the rights to your board ape, make that the cover art. And when we release the songs, what we're gonna do is when you buy that NFT, you get airdrop the instrumental and the stems. So we did only 500, 500 copies at $500 and made 250 grand overnight. So when that happened, my pops called me, he like, we need to do more. <laughs> like. I'm going to get all of the old school death row artists and they're going to re re release songs over here. So I'm setting up MetaMask wallets for all kind of artists from the 90s like Warren G, Daz, Corrupt. I'm helping all. They're like, what is MetaMask? What is that? What, what is that? How, do I need to put my credit card? In? Like I'm fighting with them, telling them like, nah, it's good. Like this is Web 3.0. This is how you buy crypto and this is how you get crypto. And, you know, it, we went back and forth, but they finally believed me and Overall, I think in 30 days we did 3.5 million. Wow, wow. And shout out to Shiv and Amador, Snoop Geek Squad. We stayed up all night for 30 days at the compound. The compound is our studio in Inglewood. It's a 20,000 square foot studio. We stayed up all night. My dad did not let us leave. He did not let us leave. We, we re they were releasing songs like 12 songs a day sometimes, 20 songs a day. And I'm like, yo, we're we going to oversaturate the market. Like, he like, I don't care. We're going to just show people that you can do this and you can do it now. Wow. The power of now, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, we have time for one last thing, and we'll leave the floor open for questions. Um, is there one thing that you'd like to tell the audience in terms of what you're looking for in Asia specifically. Is there, and, and this is individually for both of you, is there only particular, I, I hate to call music an asset class, but is there only particularly any asset classes, any kind of companies that you specialize in investing in that you are looking for, or any particular market that highlights from Asia? The answer to your first question are just big ideas. You know, there's a lot of small ideas. A lot of, I, if I, I could adjust this, to, big ideas is what we look for. Game-changing ideas. That's the most exciting. And then the answer to your second question is no. There's no nothing specific. It's it's uh, it's just you meet an entrepreneur that has a vision and a big idea, and you just got to go for it. Understood. Go ahead. I'm looking for the next Steve Jobs. I'm looking for a disruptor, somebody that's willing to bet on themselves, someone that's willing to, you know, put all their money on the line and really push forward what 
I believe is next, and that's Web 3.0. And nothing specifically, but I personally like music NFTs. I personally like metaverses. I personally like, you know, digital wearables. I think that's going to be something huge because you see with Fortnite, you see with Grand Theft Auto, gaming is so important and how your character look is even more important. So I think, you know, with all these avatars, you're going to want to personalize them and customize them um, moving forward. Um, games like Byte City, for example, I'm, I'm a, a big investor in Byte City. I think what they're creating is is phenomenal. You know, it's Web 3.0 theme park, Web 3.0 festivals. Um, creators can create and build in a, a space where it's fun and it's, you know, not so outdated, you know, because you're starting to see a lot of these metaverse games look so outdated. If you ask me personally, it's only one metaverse, and that's Roblox. So I definitely think we can have more in this space, and whoever that creator is in this room or watching this, you know, please feel free to contact myself and Fred because we're looking to invest. Thank you. Um, you know, we've got very little time, so we're going to do two things. Um, um, really open up the floor to questions and then we'll sum up the panel. So, questions, anyone? I can't see anyone's hands. There's a big, yeah, there's a big see none. <laughs> shiny light in our faces, so. This room look real smoky. I thought my daddy yeah. was in here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think before you came, for Fred and me, it wasn't smoky, and then they announced you, and then it became smoky. You mentioned the name of the song, Hi. So. Hi, good, ooh. Hi again. Yeah, very loud. Um, good afternoon. I'm right in front of you. <laughs> see you, baby. Um, so my name is Melissa. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And so my question is just basically, have you been looking at the Caribbean space at all? Um, because we're usually left out of the conversation quite a lot, um, which is obviously due to our size, um, especially where investors are concerned. There is a lot going on in our tech space, um, but we do not have the caliber of investors that you are. And uh, also we- Ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, because of limited time, could you ask the panelists the question directly? Are you looking you at the Caribbean answer? Thank you very much. Well, me personally, um, I'm friends with Rihanna. We got the same birthday. Um, and I, I didn't even know. I, I've heard a lot about the Caribbean islands getting into Web3 and, and being decentralized as a whole. Um, but me personally, I don't know much information. So if you would like to share that with my team in this room, we, we would love to hear more. Fantastic. Anyone else on questions? Oh, there's uh, the gentleman on the right. Hi there, I'm Nigel from the Philippines. Um, I know that Asia is doing a lot of movement in terms of going towards decentralized for music, but for example, if like an independent artist or someone who doesn't have a lot of like backing or funding, how would they enter into Web3? I think, like we said, you know, platforms like Audius, platforms like Sound XYZ, that it's, it's low-hanging fruit for entrepreneurs and artists to create and be heard. And, you know, there's a, a high chance that one of your favorite artists may, you know, buy that track or remix that track. Like I said, Spotty was an artist that was just known in the Web3 space to now he's collaborating with artists like Bun B, artists like Lil Wayne, Snoop Dogg, and that's all because he was releasing his music on the blockchain. And just because you don't have fans right now, that don't matter. You know, this is the early infancy stage. So just keep releasing music and keep being, you know, a, a, a proud artist of your work and, and believe in yourself. And I'd say still put your music on SoundCloud. We have the biggest audience, 60, 70 million people listening. Best place to be discovered. Forget about the Web3. Just go on SoundCloud. <laughs> Fantastic. Any more questions? Okay, there's one more. Hi, Elvin here from Singapore Art Community. I wanted to ask, um, thank, thank you for believing in Asia, but um, how do you see the difference between uh, Asian Web3 community and what you see in the US and maybe Europe? 
What do you see as the difference between Asia and the US? Is that what you asked in terms of Web3 development? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think a lot of it is similar, but a lot of it is different at the same time. I'm, I'm big on a philosophy of West meets East, East meets West. So I think just bridging the gap, because I feel like we all, all the same around the globe. We just, we gotta be in the same room. We gotta, you know, rub elbows with each other and, and you know, sit down and see if things are aligned and see what the synergies are feeling like. So I, I feel like it's all the same if you ask me. You want to add something to that, Fred? I, I think this, the innovation's coming from the U.S., the users from anywhere. I mean, but the innovations at this point is coming mainly from the U.S. Right. And, uh, you know, I remember us touching upon this sometime back to the question that he asked about the fact that the Asian markets used to be in the backyard in terms of developers and tech, and today these are fairly large consumer markets where the average age group is actually going down. And so thank you for asking that question. Um, we're a little out of time. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with the fact that these two gentlemen are in town. Asia and Singapore is certainly an area of interest for both the companies that they represent. Um, the second thing is big ideas audacious entrepreneurs and the ability to make sure and execute that those plans happen. Third part of the uh, uh, thing that came out is that the differences being with Cordell, you know, at the start of your journey, uh, and you will evolve with the entrepreneur or the company uh, in terms of a, a different kind of investing with Fred, uh, you're typically looking at an exit because, you know, our topic was to demystify um, the whole point of investing. Money, when gotten in, needs to also be invested intelligently and dispersed the right way. Money has also got a cost to it, which is return on investment on the invested capital to the investor or the original person with the money. And I think it's, it's important to know that responsibly. The, third, uh, the fourth part is that if the idea isn't big, if the idea isn't audacious, if the idea does not have a longer trajectory, um, uh, you know, it may be, perhaps maybe a bit hard to raise capital. So make sure that your ideas are good, make sure they're big, make sure they're audacious. And if you have any more things, just make sure that you talk to these two gentlemen. I'm gonna shut up now. Thank you very much for coming in on this panel. Bye-bye. A great Thank round you. of applause for Fred and Cordell.